from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good evening. From Coolidge Auditorium in the Library of Congress, Washington, D.C., WETA presents Three American Poets. This evening, poets Josephine Miles and Elder Olson will read and discuss selections from their poetry with James Dickey, consultant in poetry to the Library of Congress. Mr. Dickey, recipient of the National Book Award for his volume of 22 poems, Buck Dancer's Choice, was born in Atlanta, Georgia in 1923. Mr. Dickey's first book of poetry, Into the Stone, was published in 1960 and has been followed by four more volumes. He is now ending his second term as the library's poetry consultant. Josephine Miles, poet and scholar, received her PhD from the University of California at Berkeley, where she is now professor of English. Since the first publication of her poems in an anthology in 1935, Miss Miles has published three volumes of poetry, Lines at Intersection, Poems on Several Occasions, and Local Measures. Her interest in the philosophy of language has resulted in numerous essays and books, among them the vocabulary of poetry and the continuity of poetic language. Ms. Miles has been honored with the Shelley Award, Phelan, AAUW, and Guggenheim Fellowships. Elder Olson is a scholar and influential critic as well as a poet. His first book of poetry, Things of Sorrow, was published in 1934 and awarded by the Friends of Literature the following year. His other poetic works include The Cock of Heaven and The Scarecrow Christ. Mr. Olson was born and educated in Chicago, obtaining a Ph.D. at the University of Chicago, where he now teaches. He was the 1953 recipient of the Tejans Memorial Award for Poetry, and his critical work, The Poetry of Dylan Thomas, received the Poetry Society of America Award in 1954. And now, here is Mr. Dickey. Let us begin with Miss Miles. The first few poems I'll be reading are from Kinds of Affection, and they're about kinds of affection, uh, sad as well as happy ones. The mailman is coming from the next block down where the sycamores thin out and flowering plums begin. A little boy's mother is terrified as he beats his head on the pavement in anger. She is crying softer. From the next block down where flowering plums thin to industrial fog, coconut soap on the cottages, a great morning squabble races in which the big machines call softer. One letter from the Merchants Association asks, how improve status in its concrete forms without demolition? How does the Vogue cleaners sponge off the spot without fraying the coat? One from the Emporium of Knowledge, how can we not corrupt answers with questions? and clearly enough say to the coasting pavement, keep off the grass. One from the hill, what do we do when the formulas buckle and men beat their heads on the pavement in pure anger? Write them a letter. One third class ad from the snowfields of the Sierras, the mailman's birthplace, he says, comes cool across orchards to the bay to say to his readers, Softer, softer. Friends, in our questions, we looked together at several mysteries and argued at them long and lightly, whether they're no or yes. Now one of us is sure another's question turns counterfeit unnegotiable in a redemption by if or yet. 
wish that the future in its mysterious motion will come and will bring sureness to us all in our devotion. But though, but still. We have the generation which carries something new not far enough, and then the generation which carries it too far, and then the generation which brings it back again. Do I think of something and do you not understand it? And does it brew along without momentum? And does finally it take its place and move like sorghum in a slow slide to the future? Or do you yelp those absolutes of last degrees without which we are impatient? Come on, come on. Or do we recall a past complete, golden and still, toward which we tired turn and bring again our brilliant splendors to its ample sill? We have the body which retells ontogeny through all its narrow cells phylogeny through all its harrowed wills. As difference blends into identity or blurs into obliteration we give to zero our position at the center, withdraw our belief and baggage. As rhyme at the walls lapses, at frontiers customs scatter like a flight of snow, and boundaries moonlight draw us out, our opponents join us, we are their refuge. As barriers between us melt, I may treat you unkindly as myself, I may forget your name as my own. Then enters our anonymous assailant. As assonance by impulse burgeons and that quaver shakes us by which we are spent, we may move to consume another with us, stir into parity another's ciphers. Then when our sniper steps to a window in the brain, starts shooting, and we fall surprised, of what we know not, do we seek forgiveness from ourselves, for ourselves? In the town when, where every man is king, every man has one subject, every man bends to his own foot, bring on the mirror that he may properly bend but who will bring it on? In the castle, where is no hunger and no need, every man gives gifts and receives gifts. But of these, only his own enhance him, the ring giver. He must wear his ring. Gradually, as he resolves the oppression of his edicts, losing his fellow lords to dim perspectives, Monoliths of rock and stone, even of reinforced concrete, become before him mirrors. He licks the glass. Throwing his life away, he picks at and smells it. Done up. When did I do this up? I date its death to the time someone said something back then. Everything else, all striving, making, marrying, error, is this old bird. Pa! He throws it. As the long string lengthens out of his hand, it begins unwinding the ligaments of his hand.
Would you like me to stop there or go on and read well, another one? Uh, one? Just, uh, I was thinking, Elder, we've, we've been sitting here listening to Joe read. Uh, does this spark any immortal, critical thoughts in your mind or start any train of thought that may eventually lead to the salvation of mankind? <laughs> uh, <clears throat> briefly, no. <laughs> uh, my critical and other thoughts are very mortal. <clears throat> I was, however, <clears throat> interested in the uh, precision with which you saw a whole series of human situations. To go back to the first poem, if I may, I was interested in the way in which you had played a kind of uh, fugue on a basic theme. Uh, how does one write a poem like that? Uh, myself, I've never tried it. You mean there was a sense in the words of variation on the, on yes. the theme, mm -hmm. and with a sense of refrain and repetition? Yes. That mm -hmm. sort of thing. The softer, softer business. Uh, I think I, th I think I hear things that way. Mm -hmm. I think I, um, if I hear people talking, um, overhear people talking. I think that certain things they say come back to my mind over and over. So I probably build refrains into the world. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think of yourself primarily as a lyric poet? You, I know your enormously formidable reputation as a scholar, so maybe I'm getting on ground that I can't uh, contribute very much toward uh, building up. Uh, but uh, do you think of yourself primarily as a writer of lyrics, Joe, or as a kind of a philosophical uh, poet, or what? The kind of lyric that goes with music, uh -huh. I, d I don't have a very good sense of. But uh -huh. I would love to, you know. I'd love to, <laughs> I'd love to play the guitar. But uh, <laughs> I don't have that sense of, you know, of accompaniment, of that kind of refrain and beat. I would love to have and don't. But I think that when I hear a kind of, of lyric sound in, in speech, in the way people talk. Yes, uh, one notices that all over your poems, I think. You've caught, captured uh, conversational rhythms and uh, seen human situations, I think, with extreme precision and with a lovely humor. The, uh, the, the, way, uh, the way people restate things to each other when they're arguing or explaining yes. has a kind of pattern to it I, that seems to me poetic. Yes, that was what I yeah. was observing, yeah. of course. The main thing that I get from your poetry, at least the poems of yours that I like the, like the, the best, is a kind of a strange gnomic or philosophical quality, or kind of a, an odd generalizing quality that I don't, I don't find exactly in the same in anybody else's poet, poem. The one I cared for the most in the series that you read was the one about the, the, the kingdom in which each man is king, having mm -hmm. only one uh, person as subject. Uh, that, uh, that's, that's extremely original and also happens to be very true. No, and horrible. Uh, horrible, <laughs> horrible, right. <laughs> Uh, that, uh, that's a, uh, ultimately a kind of a social poem. It really isn't a poem about monarchies, I don't think. No, it's a yeah. poem about democracy. <laughs> well, it was a poem about a student of mine, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Did he bend to his own foot? <laughs> <laughs> or to yours, Joe? <laughs> One foot. <laughs> <laughs> well, could you read us a few more? I have one that's, that's uh, a kind of a group, and it's about um, this... <laughs> could be called a long poem, uh, could be called a group of poems about a, a, a problem of a civic enterprise in, around the San Francisco Bay Area. When I telephoned a friend, her husband told me, she's not here tonight, she's out saving the Bay. She's sitting and listening in committee chambers, maybe speaking with her light voice from the 14th row about where the birds and fish will go if we fill in the bay. The fish, she says, includes starry flounder, Pacific herring, rockfish, surf perches, and the flatfish who come to the spawning flats in the shallow waters near the narrow shores. The shadow look you know, 
the fish shooting in that light green shallow, a dark arrow. Otherwise, we will get a bowling alley, a car park and golf course with financing, sift up the shallows into a solid base with sand dredged from the deeper channels, brought in scows or hopper dredges and dumped on the fish, and then paved over for recreation with no cost to the city. <laughs> and so we hear the sides, the margins speaking, to allow the commission in the public interest permits for the recovery of sand and gravel from the submerged tidelands of the state, fill of unlimited quality, clean sand replenished by the southern littoral drift. Or yet, dear sirs, your bill flies in the face of the U.S. Army Engineers Barrier Study, the Delta Study, the Transportation Study, even the Petroleum Institute plan for bringing freighters and hundreds of workers into Contra Costa to boat, bathe, drink, and return these waters. A student, <laughs> a student I remember said to me, my mother wants me to be a banker, but I want to be a sanitary engineer, spending all that money back toward the sea. Do you think it's possible? See how these hills shape down back of the college, in summer streaked with little dry arroyos, in winter running over rush and freshet, through storm drains, cellars, sometimes parlors, straight away down to the sea. Think of the veins of this earth all flowing, raining water, the drove of rivers in the pipes we've laid. Effluent, said my student, there's a word. Give me a choice between it and debris. And any day I'd choose effluent. Cover and fill as bleach and burn with tires sticking up out of the muck and loads of old brush and tree branches crisping away there. Not for me. I like the purest water sparkling green under a soil and it can breeze out of our pipes and chemicals loosened as the rain itself around the bodies of fish and swimmers. Saving the bay, saving the shoals of day, saving the tides of shallows deep begun between the moon and sun, saving the sidings of the Santa Fe, saving the egret and the herring run, cane and acacia, mallow and yarrow save against the seventh wave. Boundary and margin, meeting and met, so that the pure sea will not forget, voracious as it is, its foreign kind. And so the land, voracious as it is, will not redeem another's diadem. Saving the shores, saving the lines between kelp, shrimp, and the scrub green, between the lap of waters and the long shoulder of stone. Therein, between, no homogeneous dredge, but seedy edge of action and of chance met to its multiple and variable circumstance. Though a news column says that aquatic park is a police headache, in the past year, 87 arrests of characters for crimes better not talked about, that the lake is a favorite dumping spot for hot safes, burglary tools, stripped bikes, even a body, Yet a notice says, next week at Aquatic Park, the V Drive Boating Club holds its annual race. Everybody comes out for this event. These are the world's fastest boats, faster than hydros, needing the quiet water the embankment provides. And a letter from a statistician, fond of the facts, compares the use of Aquatic Park to the Rose Garden, the same pattern. Fewest people, about five each on a Friday of terrible weather. Next, about 50 on a f warm Wednesday afternoon. Most, 150 on a clear, windy Saturday. Signed, sincerely, statistician. Some live in the deeps, a freighter plying between here and Yokohama. Some live in the rose gardens, deeps of a street a two-storied observer and participant daily move, moving out into the traffic, back into it, where curtains billow in their breakfast room.
the deeps. Some live in the margins. Have they the golden mean? Freight whistles reach here and the fire engines coming from town. Foundry hammers among the wash of waves. Kelp drifts them up afloat and suddenly they are in the tender world of lizards. Cut ashore, they bask and breathe and then plunge back down the long glints that take their weight at home, at home, but which? Likely a sea captain will live in a margin but never wants to, wants a deep molded farm. Likely an architect but mainly weekends. On the weekdays along the bay margin, little happens. Small objects breed and forage. Flights come in and vanish. Solicitudes entail solicitudes. Dredge the channel, reinforce the seawall, we shall have deep calling to deep directly. She starts to speak, my friend, in her light voice of margins, marshes, birds, and embarcaderos. Truths spread to dry like nets, mended like nets, draw in at the edges their corruptions to let the moving world of bay and town mingle as they were amphibian again. Saving the bay, saving the blasted bay, that there be margins of the difference, scrap heap and mobile, wind ridge and ledge, mud and debris, that there be shore and sea. Let me just ask you one thing uh, before we conclude your part of the performance. Uh, it strikes me that your, your verse is an, as an absolute triumph of colloquialism and that some of your phrases uh, reveal, as no one else else's do, uh, maybe uh, Marianne Moore's would be the closest affinity. Uh, what, what latent poetry there is in ordinary kinds of verbal sources like newspaper uh, mm -hmm. uh, accounts and so on. Now, since you move so well in this particular idiom, uh, you would sur surely prefer it, that is for your own work, to a highly artificial kind of language such as, say, Gerard Manley Hopkins uses or that uh, Dylan Thomas uses, that, that is, it would be artificial to us or that uh, an American poet like John Berryman uses. Uh, would you want to comment on this, this? Hopkins actually wrote that he thought potato was a terribly bad word that could not be used in poetry, and that always struck me as funny. <laughs> who, who could object to potato? <laughs> <laughs> so yes, uh, it, I can admire it very much, but I can't, I can't, I don't, you know, hear it mm -hmm. in my own head. Yes, yes. Well, Alda, would you like to oblige us now? Yes, I will. <clears throat> the first poem I'm going to read is called Chess Game. My enemy and I are playing chess. Trapped by an idiot's trick of circumstance, a rainy weekend, and a woman's whim. Civilization affects this at least, that face to face, in rigid courtesy, we sit like friends and share a narrow board, two who can barely breathe in the same world. What mends the manners need not mend the man. To be unmended is to reenact, ghost-like, old wickedness. And so we do. Reckless as emperors, we sacrifice pawns ignorant as peasants, why they die. Now I trick him with a wooden horse. His castle falls as bitterly as Troy. What's strong as hatred? 
Joy has no such glee. Greed is less eager. Love less intimate. Locked in an intricate interplay as fierce and delicate as the tact of swords, we know each other to the soul. Can love do that? Feel our own blows. Exchange identities. Becoming each other, remain enemies. I move and nearly pinch my pawn in half. His nostrils sharpen as he shifts his queen. Knight, castle, king, all ancient symbols, almost meaningless now, powerless in themselves, but potent still with powers we still confer. What if we should deny them? We do not cling to our antique world, four-cornered, flat, and hosts identical in all but hue make hue their quarrel, having nothing else. The godless priests pursue their bias still. The lightless, uninhabitable towers move from their stations, and four horsemen ride till all are swept away to leave behind empty spaces, blackened or stained red. In a less grim mood, a poem called Ice Skaters. <coughs> Excuse me. Snow hills all about, and snowy woods, and snow falling, a full moon's out, the river's frozen across its avenue of ice, vivid skaters swirl in the cold, in the moon's light. Look, look, the young, the old, set moving by delight. The whole town's on the ice, whirling in a gay, preposterous ballet. Look, the strides, the glides, cussock leaps, dervish twirls, clown tumblings, clown falls. Racers wrapped in speed as in an ecstasy, swerving in a flash of sleet. Lovers hand in hand, enchanted by their own music without sound. And the older pairs, a little clumsy now, but Mary is waltzing bears. And children, intently scuffing foot by foot, stiffly rocking in and out, all intricately winding in a Christmas-colored maze with Lord what a racket, till the hills go wild with echoes, bellow like mad bulls. And in the dark ravines, beneath the crystal floor, fish quiver and wave their fins. The town clock chimes the hour, unheeded. Let it chime, time has lost its power. What monkey shines, what fun. Flesh is no burden now, it never lay so lightly on the bone. The body too can be spirit when set free by pure delight of motion without destination. Shows its own fantasy, wit, and imagination. Is this the being Lear could call a poor, bare-forked animal? Strike that out. Say this, that in a harsh season, above a dark abyss, the mortal creature rejoiced in its own nature, reveled itself the reason. By life's a carnival, snow falls like confetti now. The moon, in comic mood, turns to a grotesque snowball, hides in cloud, comes back in a clown's mask. The skaters swirl and swirl. All their motions cry, it is joy, sheer joy, that makes the atoms dance and wings the flying stars and speeds the sun upon his golden course. I should now like to read a poem called The Daguerreotype of Chopin. Uh, I have been in love with Chopin nearly all of my life, and I have seen 
many portraits and sketches and caricatures and sculptures. But a number of years ago, to my infinite shock, I came upon an actual photograph, or in fact, a daguerreotype. This poem arose out of my shock and the reflections following that shock. I uh, thought at once, I may say, of a couple of passages of Chopin's letters, in one of which he says, and I abridge this, <clears throat> the world fades about me in an entirely strange manner. I lose myself. I no longer have any strength. I feel alone, alone, alone. Uh, here's the poem, then. Huddled in a heavy coat, as if shivering even indoors in the Parisian spring, haggard, faintly frowning. Incuriously you peer, not the Chopin of caricature or portrait, but the living, dying man. Blanched collar, dark cravat, long locks, the strange hair of the sick, the arched nose, shadowing hollow cheek, and feebly parted lips, the frail, famous hands, chalk white, crossed as if to hint at the not remote event. All still, until a little patience should make momentary stillness absolute. Then, too, despair itself has its own quietude. <clears throat> On the draped tabret at which you do not look, lies an unsuspected omen, a closed book. You sit indifferent, haughty, neat, on your flesh all but drained of blood. Almost visibly, vampires feed. Son of your century, you were haunted like Baudelaire, like Poe. What summoned you to go down midnight galleries, eavesdropping on cries and clangors from the abyss? Was it wise, trespassing on paradise? Could this world not suffice? The blood fretted in your veins till you turned all senses into one, enchanting into tone, feel of velvet, steel, sun's warmth, moon's chill, smart of poisons, fever of wines, rose color form, fragrance, sound even of silence and all the romantic images, mist-bound fragile palaces, ships in curled fantastic seas, trophies of ancient loves and wars, and of course, the fashionable objects of crypt and charnel house. What emperor sorcerer was yours? Upon what terms over the wild worlds of air? When Poland fell, you made out of your sacked and burning heart the Poland no enemy could invade. Here the priceless gift at last reveals its terrifying cost, body and soul laid waste. Would all that melody in its delicate ornament have gone unheard unless a man were warped and bent like the vials would to be its instrument? And is such suffering, such blight, needful to such beauty then as to the nightingale, the night? Then what powers, demonic or divine, curse, bless in one touch, wreck the mortal man to build the immortal from his ruin, or our God and demon one? Do I have another minute? Oh, yes, yeah. sure. I should like to read a poem now called Crucifix, always providing that I can find it. Crucifix. Here is a silver crucifix to recall immortal agony, the mortality of the immortal. Christ crucified again 
but painlessly in effigy, all wrought to grace, anguish translated to beauty, suffering feigned in calm silver. Look at this, then think of the actual scene. Friday, Friday the 13th, as some think, hot and bright at first, but gradually darkening and chilling. The rock and sway of a great packed crowd, a crowd like any other that comes to witness executions with market baskets and bundles and purses and other tokens of lives that would be resumed after this interruption. A crowd with children and dogs crawling in and out through the forests of legs. Think of the straining, the craning to see as hammers and nails behaved after the fashion of hammers and nails. Though the nails went through veins and flesh and wedged bones apart. And then the cross raised the third of that day, displaying to all eyes, eyes glittering or somber, lust lit or horror struck, but mostly curious, the head turning slowly from side to side, as always with the pinned or the impaled, the eyes already wrapped with suffering, the hands nailed like frogs to the rough cross timber, the feet spiked to the foot block. Amid cries and murmurs, the cross raised, and after a little while, the eyes of the spectators straying, their lips beginning to discuss other executions and other things than executions, the crowd slowly dispersing, the best parts being over, leaving only a few whispering at the foot of the cross in the gathering dark and the Roman soldiers, to whom this was another execution, glad to relax after the anxieties of maintaining discipline. Think of the terrible solitude of the cross, of that body shuddering, for it was a body, and the knees buckling as they would till straightened convulsively in the drag of the body's weight on the hands and the aching armpits, and again and again buckling and straightening again and again throughout the long day as weakness overcame pain and pain weakness and the painful thirst of the wounded worse than the wounds and the flies to whom Christ's blood was as any other. And worse than all, the fear, the increasing fear that all had been illusion save this pain, this death. For we think that none, not even God, may put on the man's shape and not feel this fear, and this in the terrible solitude of the cross. Think of this, gaze your fill on it, then remember it is the Christ that sanctifies the cross, not the cross Christ, and remember it is not preeminence and pain that makes the Christ, for the thieves as well were crucified, no, but the Godhead the untouchable, unguessable, unsuffering immortality beyond mortality, which feigns our mortality as this silver feigns it, and of which we are ignorant as that multitude. For the pain comes from the humanity, the pain we know, the agony we comprehend, of the rest know nothing. Joe, do you, does this spark any uh, line of discourse in you? Because it surely does in me. I, uh, do you want to talk a little about, about that? Uh, I wonder if they have anything in common. Yes, the, what impresses me very much is the sense not only that Elder is thinking about that, that we are listening to a line of thought developing, but that it comes to true conclusions. These are, it's, it's so hard to make poems end right, and, and these from Troy on end just right, I think. And, and that's hard to do, because you often don't know quite where you're taking yourself in a poem. Well, what I like the most about uh, Aldous' poems is that, is that uh, he is, I think, preeminent among the poets of our time. Uh, uh, 
among those who see philosophic implications in, in uh, situations and objects that uh, don't seem to suggest those to anybody but him. The chessboard, for example, becomes uh, emblematic of quite another thing than a simple game. Uh, the castle is taken seriously as a castle, for example, uh, which I think is wonderful. Uh, and, uh, and the bloodless uh, intellectual game uh, is seen uh, as something which is very, very much like actual warfare and even of the most terrible kind. Uh, as Elder says, his enemy is still his enemy. And can love do that? Uh, maybe I misquote a little bit, but mm -hmm. uh, that, that kind of idea, I think, is marvelously fruitful for poetry. The philosophical, uh, philosophic ex extension uh, of the rather ordinary object uh, which does indeed in itself involve just such philosophical implications as the poet draws out from them, uh, such as the war from the, the chess game or the, the battle in the artist, as in the portrait of Chopin, of the thing that destroys him and the thing that creates his art, or demon and, and God the same, or the last thing, the, the crucifix, which is, which is ordinarily looked on as kind of, a, of an objet d'art. Uh, something something uh, artists have worked with. Uh, Elder asks you to, to understand the real implications and watch and think of what it was for the real man to die on the actual cross that made the silver crucifix that is so familiar to us possible. Uh, think of what this means, really. And, and that I like. You, you, we have a little more time. Elder, would you read, a, read one or two more? I'd be delighted. I'll read a poem called The Fountain. The marble water god amid water lights utters cold mysteries from unmoving lips, water language, bubbling syllables, a water voice murmuring as if to say, I, this mercurial element, was wave and cloud, the rainbow and the rain, fire at the icicle's heart, heart's blood of the rose, and am and shall be all again. I am a heaven for cloud slow swans to sail, an abyss, a raging gulf, a monster pit, a mirror wherein each thing sees its image. I become whatever drinks of me, bird beast, flower. Nevertheless, I am none of these, and myself alone, without shape or color, but tomb and cradle, one and many, variable and eternal. You will never comprehend me. Come, drink. I will now read another grisly Olson poem. <laughs> I always like to end on a grisly note. This is called <clears throat> Directions for Building a House of Cards. This is a house of cards. To build this house, you must have patience and a steady hand. That is the difficulty. You must have a steady hand, no matter what has happened. And unless something has happened, you will not care to build this house of cards. <laughs> and you must have cards, enough to tell your fortune or make your fortune. But to build this house, you must see all fortunes merely as so many cards, differing, no doubt, but not for you. You must know this and still keep a steady hand. And you must have patience and nothing better to do than to make this toy because it was your way to make a toy of fortune which was not your toy. Until at last you have nothing better to do than to build this final thing with nothing inside. Fool's work, a monument of folly, but built with difficulty, because everything is difficult. Once you understand that after what has been, 
Nothing can be but things like this, with nothing inside like you. You must see this and somehow keep a steady hand. <laughs> Uh, well, we have some t time for some talk, and uh, uh, maybe we can read another poem or two if, if time is, uh, uh, is kind enough, but if it isn't, we can take it out and talk. Um, I think, Joe, could you read us another one? Because I have something I want to think about, and also I want to hear you read it. <laughs> another one. <laughs> well, um... I could. I was reading poems about middle age there a while back. Maybe I could try one about a middle age plus a young girl. You could say this is a poem about a trip. Yesterday evening, as the sun set late, we parked at Land's End, past the Golden Gate, to see the cypress lean in from that ocean, and the wave path lengthen to the lengthening sun. In the VW over beside us, a yellow-haired girl looked at us with a radiance hardly receivable. We smiled and turned back to the sea as she held out her arms to us. Her blown voice said to the three with her, I know why you brought me here, to love these mixed up people, and I do. See, they are smiling at me, poor, sad, mixed up people. Her friends sheltering walked with her to the cliff's edge. Deep to the rocks, far to the falling sun, she reached her hand. She saw her hand, held it close to her eyes, widened its fingers, hand translucent. Who will keep it? She put it inside the coat of the yellow-haired boy and he leaned over her like the wind. When she came back to the car, she had lost her hand, lost us. We said goodbye as they drove off. A trawler crossed between us and the sun. Very good. Yes, thank you. <laughs> uh, I'd, I'd like, if I had a, if I had a wish that could come true tonight, I'd like to have Elder conclude. He's already concluded once, but he can now <laughs> conclude beyond conclusion uh, with a kind of a scary ghost poem that I like. Would you read him the Ballad of the Four Black Bog Men? <laughs> <laughs> I read this uh, to my children all the time. And, uh, I'll you know. have to find it if you'll okay. give me a minute. If you have one. Uh, and uh, it really is very scary and one of the most ingenious poems I know. Uh, and it's a true ballad as well, with a real scary ballad. <laughs> I um, um, may put in a, as a note to this poem that I was greatly impressed by some of the songs sung in Pogo Possum, if you read Pogo Possum, with the nearly un unpronounceable clusters of consonants. And I decided to fool with that and see what I could do. So this is called The Four Black Bogmen. Oh, she took the babe, still slick from the water bag, bathed it and swathed it and cradled it then in a willow basket and carried it through the pit black woods to a fog roofed fen. There, amid plashy ferns, she laid it and watched the slug black ooze slip in. An old man rose from the smoking rushes. Oh, why do you walk on the tip over tussocks and heaving hummocks of slippery quags? Think twice when you do what you came to do, or the four black bogmen who set such snags will track you down and switch shapes with you. Every one of the four is a sharp shape trader who can look like a toad or a bubble in the bog, a snipe on a stick or a snail on a stalk, a worm in a web 
or a bead in the fog. Oh, how do you know, you old swamp squatter? I am the first. And he grabbed, and he had her. Oh, she watched as he swanked in her shape through the swamp. Then, shaky and old, she hobbled away till she tripped on the roots of a big toad stump. And there, as she stuck, the slick roots quickened, slipped round like black snakes, that trap of a tree hissed in her ear, I am the second. Oh, a bad shape sat in her sticks like a bird, yet what could trouble a root-rotten tree? Through the misty forest stumbled a rickety cripple of a leper, bagging wood, who clutched at a branch as if to break it. The lipless mouth said, I am the third. Oh, now on a leper's pegs she pottered to stop her trick in the nick if she could. In the snake-black mire, in the coiling mud, there was the child, choking in muck. Oh, how she snatched, how she cuddled. It shuddered, clung with its bog-black claws, and spoke. <laughs> Good endings. Stay away from those swamps now. <laughs> <laughs> that is, if you're going to throw your babies in. <laughs> uh, well, we have uh, just a few minutes, uh, and we can we can take off and go anywhere, uh, in, intellectually anyway. That, that would that would. Uh, well, <laughs> shall we talk about the death of the lyric, or um, we could do that. How uh, it's, uh, I'm not no, sure. I think it's been reborn tonight. <laughs> <laughs> how it's no longer possible to write verse, or if yes. you do, you must write it in syllables instead of uh, meter and oh, so on. Oh yes. Well, we could we could, might touch on all those. Do you think we could settle that in five problems. minutes? <laughs> but uh, listening to the before Black Bogman, it strikes me that that there's an enormous audience for poetry, uh, which which is as comprehensible as that is, and as uh, and as uh, immediate. And it's, uh, it's, it, uh, I suppose, has an abstruse or uh, philosophical dimension, but it's also immediately experienceable. Uh, I wonder if, uh, if uh, you feel that there's a, there's a large audience possible for poetry through this kind of medium or, or another more simple uh, kind of verse that we've been used, used to getting. Well, I, I think there's a great uh, place for narrative verse and dramatic verse of all kinds. In fact, if I had to talk uh, in answer to your question to Josephine there about what kind of poet she considered herself, I would say I was a dramatic poet more than anything else. And uh, uh, I have been distressed to see uh, the way in which prose forms have gradually taken over everything, narration, uh, drama, and whatnot. And the poets, as it seems to me, has simply been in retreat uh, all this while. Yet, uh, I find prose myself a very wasteful medium in which to write. It's mu uh, much more easily possible to say things, uh, I think, in verse. There's a great impact in the, in the, the Berkeley police force of a, of a policeman who recites Edward Edward and Lord Randolmice and, and makes people realize that the problem's been going on for years. <laughs> and the power of the ballad is a great thing. Yes, this, I think so too. I, I, I don't. I, I've tried some ballads, but I don't have the touch. But I'm going to get it. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, but I, I think there's an enormous uh, um, interest in this kind of um, uh, media, which really does medium, which really does come out of the folk in some way, however devious, uh, in which, in which, uh, in which the poetic, uh, the authentic poetic element will, 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 will be. Uh, as a parent to the, uh, uh, the person on the on the, the lower edge end of the educational ladder, as as it is to the person on the higher end, uh, uh, some some poets are working in this, but not enough. Uh, I think about writing ballads. Uh, what what ought to be stressed is how how much sheer fun and enjoyment it is. Uh, to make a story go this way with this this kind of memorability factor, uh, who 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 could who could read, for example, the famous old ballad of Sir Patrick Spence and forget the first lines? The king sits in Dunferling Town drinking the blood red wine. That this is not difficult, not ambiguous. 
uh, and not uh, full of paradoxes and so on, my, although some critics might argue that it is full of paradoxes as anything. Uh, but uh, but uh, you don't have to see it that way. You can see it that way, but you don't have to see it that way. And I think, I think it, it's an awfully good uh, uh, thing to conclude, or poem to conclude this evening with, uh, uh, with the eldest black bogman, because this is, this is on one level a very shrewd, sly, humorous poem, and also it's a wonderful story <laughs> to have the, the black bogman switching shapes with the initial character and so on, and then coming around full circle. This is, this is really true art and true craft, but within a very accessible kind of medium. Uh, well, I don't want to start a poetic revolution on the basis of tonight's uh, performance, although really I think it's the basis of quite a good one. Uh, but uh, only, only to say uh, that I've scarcely ever, ever been happier. I announced how happy I was to have, uh, have Joe Miles and Elder Olson with us this evening, uh, and I want to conclude with saying how happy I have been uh, to have them and also to have you. Uh, with us as well. Yeah. Three American poets with Josephine Miles and Elder Olson in discussion with James Dickey has been presented by WETA in cooperation with the Library of Congress. The library's literary programs are made possible by the Gertrude Clark Whittall Poetry and Literature Fund. This has been a production of WETA, Washington, D.C. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.